an open Bible. Stand with us this morning as we go into the presence of God. Hallelujah. Woo! We're here to praise this morning. worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. Our God, He holds the victory. Yeah! There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Come on, church. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God, he's still rolling stones away. Yeah, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. We were the beggars, but now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord Day. And we won't be quiet. Shout it out. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Hey. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Gonna shout out your praise. We'll shout out your praise. Shout it out. Shout it out. Shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. Give him a shout of praise this morning. He's worthy. He's worthy of your praise. Despite your situation, he's worthy of your praise this morning. Hallelujah to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. We praise you, God. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, oh. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let 
praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Gonna let it rise. Savior, back 
song over your lives this morning, over situations that you are facing, over situations your family is facing. He is our way maker. He's our promise keeper. And even when he's quiet, he's still at work. He's still at work. Let the faith of God rise up on the inside of you this morning, church. He's at work in your midst. Hallelujah. You are here. I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, moving in our midst, I worship you. I worship you. 
You're working. 
there's been a lot of prayer that's gone in this day. Jesus is a way maker. We can't just sing that song. We gotta believe it. And so you may not know what, what, what way out. Maybe you're looking for direction. I don't know. Please step out and let us lay hands on you. If you see people stepping out in the aisle, so I want you just to lay your hands on them. We're gonna say a prayer. You know, deliverance can happen at any moment. But I think there's no greater opportunity than, than in a time of we are worshiping the king. It's almost like the king wanting to bless the people. And I believe that with all my heart, that we, we take a step of faith, stepping out, saying, Lord God, I need help with this. I need you to make a way. I don't know the way, but I know you're the way. So in the name of Jesus, we say a prayer right now, God. We believe for our friends, Lord Jesus, and and, and even those who may have come in, even those who are online, God, that, that might have a need right now, I, I pray that the Spirit of God would quicken them, that they would feel and sense there's something happening. And Lord, we are asking and believing, God, for not only deliverance, God, but freedom. Freedom in Jesus' name. Lord, you came to give us salvation free so that we could live life free. And I pray, God, that you would Give us direction if we need direction. Make a way through the wilderness. God, deliver us when there can be deliverance from sickness and illness and struggle. Lord God, heal. Forgive, Lord, where there needs to be forgiveness, Father. Whatever circumstance may be standing in for somebody we love, we pray, God, that your spirit would go and minister to we believe every prayer makes a difference. Every single prayer. So, Father God, we agree with this one. Right now, that your will be done in all of our lives. Hallelujah. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say, amen, amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. We've had quite a time this last week from 7 to 8 in the morning. And I, and I realize not everybody can make that time. But there were a number of people. There were times that we had 30, 40 people here just wandering, praying, and worshiping. I, you know, I, I have never had a, a, a time of prayer and fasting that has impacted me more than this last two weeks. And there were times that I would just sit down here, and there were times that, that I would just be immersed in the presence of God, lost. When I enter this sanctuary, it becomes a church because the Holy Spirit comes with me. But there's something about the place. We're going to talk a lot about the place today. There's some, something about the place of worship. From the very beginning of Moses' tabernacle to today, it's always been about a place where God says, I want to meet you. And, and he meets us. He meets us. This is how it works. God said, you, you provide the place. You take care of the furnishings. And remember last week we talked about the fact that all of us are priests. We are the holy priesthood. If we're believers in Jesus, we get promoted to priest. And what you just did, praying for people, asking God, agreeing together, that's what a priest does. Each and every one of you. Matt sent me a picture this week. Matt Veal. And uh, he, was in, he was in the middle of Walmart, and uh, he took a picture of the battery section. <laughs> For those of you that weren't here last week, you're not going to get this. See, this is why you've got to be here every week. Um, but he was in the battery section, he took this picture, and he sent it to me, and he just had one line on the text. He says, uh, should I pitch my tent? 
And I laughed, I, I literally, I, when I said LOL, I was laughing out loud. And I said, absolutely, with an exclamation point, pitching our tent. Right now, we're pitching our tent right here. We put things together, but we want the Holy Spirit to be the driving force. I love you, Jesus. It's humbling to be in the presence of God. And God's going to speak to you today. And it may have nothing to do with what the message is about or what the song is about, but he's going to speak to you because he wants to. He wants to. So be open to that. Whether you're in these chairs or whether you're on that couch or whether you're in that car, God wants to speak to us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say welcome <laughs> to all of you who, are, who have come. And there may be guests here. At, maybe you've just come in and you're looking for, this is a great church family. Man, we would love to have you. We're, we're always wanting people to come, and, and they come with different gifts and whatnot. And then some just come because they're hungry for things of God. That's the best of all. Uh, Jesus is the way. I mean, we, we really believe this. We really live it out. And we don't just do church. We, we believe that this is a great place to be. And, uh, and so we welcome you here. If you're online and you've never been on before, there's a, oh, you can hit buttons to connect with us. We want you to do that. But we're glad you're here. You can just check us out. And, and we want you to know that we love you. Because there's always people who will be watching and learning and growing and finding. And that's a wonderful thing. So we're glad that you're all here today. We welcome you. If you've brought your offering for the Lord, we have a slot in the back and we have a slot up front here where you can place your offering there for the King of Kings. And, and once you give that offering to him, the Lord uses that to, to, to do what we do. And there is so much that we do. I wish you could just join me for a week around here. I wish you could. It is, it is uh, Christian chaos is what it is. And I, I love it. You know, I've talked about the noise of children. I love disruption as long as it's not too disruptive. But it means that there's, there's children in the room and they're, they're learning, they're growing, we're, there's investment there. So thank you for your giving. Thank you for your faithfulness because it, it, it helps us do things that you can't even see. You'll never see this side of heaven. There are things that are happening here that I'll never see this side of heaven. So thank you for your giving. If you're giving online, there's a, a button you can click on and you can give online. But we thank you for your faithfulness. And God looks down upon that and he blesses it. He loves watching, by the way. You know the story he told to the disciples. And he's pointed out, see, right from there, right from that heart. God loves that. So we welcome you here. We want to connect with you. There's a connection card in your bulletin. You fill that out. If you've got a prayer request, if you need some information, put it on there. We make sure, put it in slot, and we'll, we'll, we'll get it or leave it at the information desk. We'll get those. But uh, connect with us that way. If you're online, you can click that button. If you've got a phone that you'd like to scan, and, and uh, you know, if you're high tech, we got one of those codes for you there too. Any way we can, we want to connect with you. We want, we want to be a part of who you are, we want you to be a part of who we are. And so thank you so much for coming today. So we've got a number of things that we've got planned. You know, we make our plans, the Lord directs our steps. And uh, it's always fun to watch these little announcement videos. How many like the announcement videos? They're kind of fun. And, and uh, I don't watch them on purpose because honestly, I like to see them just like you see them, just, just right then. So watch these announcements on the screen. Hey church, welcome to today's worship service. We are so glad to see you here. Now, please turn your attention to these super serious announcements. What do you think of when I say the word fiesta? Do you think of great food? Do you think of 
a lot of energy and a whole lot of fun. Maybe you think, mmm, great music. Whatever you think, this year I'm thinking something a little different. I'm thinking Grow and Go event. If you've never been to one of our Creekside Christian School Grow and Go events, you have to come. It's money for a good cause. It's our fundraiser for our eighth grade missions trip. And the evening is just amazing. We have incredibly great entertainment. We have an amazing silent auction and the fun just continues. And so tickets go on sale this Friday. You can get them online, but I'd prefer it if you got it from a seventh grade student. If you have also a good or a service that you want to donate to our silent auction, I'd love it if you'd connect with me. Listen, church, you always do an amazing job of supporting our school. We are very thankful for that. And so here's another opportunity. Won't you join us for the Grow and Go event? In case you can't tell, we like to have fun here at Open Bible. Speaking of fun is our family skate night. Now, just like last year, this event will take place down at Main Street Square from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. This event is free for anyone. Just like last year, Alternative Fuel will be open for this event. They'll also be serving one free hot chocolate to each person. If you like ice skating, if you like drinking hot beverages, or if you like just standing around and talking with awesome people, we want to see everyone at this event. For the last few years, we have gone to Tijuana, Mexico and supported the Hunsaker family as they are doing their ministry down there by building a home for a family. This year, we're going to do the Tijuana trip a little bit differently. It's going to be a Tijuana family trip. Kids 10 and up are welcome to come with their parents, and it is going to be an amazing time of ministry. You don't want to miss out. So we're going to have an informational meeting on January 28th at 6 p.m. We're going to have some nachos together, my favorite. I hope to see you there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wanted Randall to come and help us with this uh, this dedication of a, of a new of a new day. We're just it's just there's newness here, and uh, we want to make it a special. Plus, I wanted to to grab Randall. Randall Bach is. Uh, has been a president of Old Bible for 10 years, correct? And, uh, and this is the year that he is, uh, he is allowing, he's passing that baton. And so in June, we'll be electing a new president, so be in prayer about that. But um, I wanted to get first on his schedule for his farewell tour, so here we go. And, uh, and let me tell you something, I think a lot of Randall and Barbara, and, and I, I've said, I think I've said this before, we're from the same hometown, Iowa Falls, Iowa. Same church, sat in the same uh, theater-style pews, and uh, and have the same experiences. You'll hear a, hear a story about that today, in fact. But um, he's been a mentor of mine all through these years. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, I always wondered how would Randall do this, and uh, always with excellence. And uh, Barbara by his side, you can't hardly think of Randall without Barbara. And, uh, boy, I could, I could tell a few stories, actually. Um, anyway, I won't get going on that. Huh? But, but, but I, I highly respect this man and this woman. They, are, they, are, they have given their lives to God, and uh, they've come to share with us. And so I want you to give a huge welcome to Brother Randall Bach. Thank you, man. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It is such a joy to be here. And Pastor Randy, uh, the feelings are mutual. I love you. Watched you over all the years. Uh, I was thrilled when, of course, to learn that you would be coming here to be pastor of this church. I knew it would be a fit here, so I deeply appreciate it. And the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, don't get here real often. If you're visiting today, so am I. And it's a good place to visit. In fact, if I were living in this place, this is where I'd be. I uh, highly recommend this church to you. Those of you online, maybe you're looking for a church home. I highly recommend the Open Bible Church to you. 
Uh, Barbara and I have been doing this for quite a while over the years. Uh, when I finally conclude doing this work, I will have been serving Open Bible Churches in one capacity or another for 51 years. And uh, so, well, thank you. Thank you. I can't be that old, so I don't know. Uh, however, I do know this. Barbara, if you would stand, you have to put the camera down long enough to, uh, be, I just want them to see who you are. He's already mentioned to you, but let them see who you are. This is my, my partner in crime. And we are working on our 52nd year of, of marriage together. And uh, I was 12 and she was 10. <laughs> Obviously, you get to this point in life, you live in a lot of denial. So. <laughs> Truly, it's uh, good to come into the house of the Lord, isn't it? Yep. To worship Him. There's a freedom here, isn't there? Freedom to worship Him and the wonderful worship team that you have. And it's when our hearts unite together like this that God is glorified. God says, I'll top that. I'll add to it. I'll do even more. That's who God is. Do you know, do they give away Academy Awards for church uh, commercials, uh, church announcements? Do you know whether they do? I'd vote for this, wouldn't you? I, I mean, tell you. In fact, that's good stuff. Um, I, in fact, I'd like to have the link to that because I'd like to show that off to some other people if I could, okay? See what they're doing in Rapid City, Okay. Let the coast be the coast. Rapid City is where this came from, okay. <laughs> I want to thank you for your partnership with Open Bible Churches. For all of these years, together, the Lord has been using us to do things around the world. And I, although we don't have the statistics for 2022 yet, we're still compiling those, uh, I'd like you to look at the statistics for 2021. And these are some of the things that we know over, the, over the, that year. We had uh, over 18,000 people come to the Lord. Um, yeah, we had about... <laughs> 7,000 water baptisms, about 2,400 baptized in the Holy Spirit. 10,000 plus in-state students around the world. Praise God, isn't that wonderful? Rejoicing over that. And you know what? That doesn't, even, um, that doesn't even begin to touch all the people who've been called into service for the Lord during that time. We won't really know the numbers there, but we know he's doing it. And that brings me back to you again and thanking you for your partnership with Open Bible because we have churches all over the United States, and, and we're not huge, but we have churches all over the United States and, and also around the world. And when I think about the churches who are affiliated with Open Bible, and I think about Rapid City Open Bible Church, this is one of our anchor churches. I don't know if you know what an anchor church is. Here's how, let me define for you an anchor church. An anchor church is that kind of church that year in and year out stays the course, remains faithful to the call of God, remains faithful in going, remains faithful in giving, remains faith, faithful in, in uh, serving, uh, remains faithful in every way through good times and difficult times. You stay to the course. And, and I, Rapid City Open Bible, you're one of those churches. I get around, okay? I know a lot of churches, and, and I just want to affirm you today and thank you so much. You're good, you're good people, and, and you're being faithful to following the Lord. So, and also, over the years, you've sent out so many people, too. And I'm believing for a new wave of people to come from this church. How about that, huh? A new wave of people to come out of this church to serve the Lord in various callings, could be in the marketplace, could be as a missionary, could be as a pastor. And believe me, there are many needs like that today. It's not something that we do. It's something that God must do, but we must be responsive to his call upon our lives. So I just want to thank you for your role and rejoice together over those things that, that God is doing around the world through Open Bible Churches. I really like your theme, Raising the Sails. Uh, in fact, I think what we're doing today has a real connection to that because generations of seafarers have known that the only way you're going to get anywhere if you're going to depend upon the wind, you have to raise the sails. You can't see the wind. 
You can't really tell the wind where to go. You have to sense where the wind is going. You have to sense the current of the wind, and then you put up your sails so that you catch and flow with that wind. Of course, you know where I'm going with that. The wind is one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit. And even so, the Holy Spirit, the wind listeth where it will. It will blow where it will. And people who are understanding of that realize, okay, I can't chart my own course necessarily until I know where the wind is going and I want to go with it. I want my sails to look like that. I want them to be full. And that's what you're emphasizing and that's what's powerful for us, for us both as individuals and also as the corporate body as a church. There's many things. I like my dad who always used to have the statement. He said, I don't understand everything I know about that. I don't understand everything about the Spirit. I just know some things about the Spirit, and I know I want to run with Him. Amen? I want to go where He leads. So as part of raising our sails, we're going to dedicate this sanctuary, rededicate this sanctuary, this worship center to the Lord this morning. And to do that, I have to let the history teacher in me come out a little bit, okay? Let's put that into historical perspective just a bit. Throughout the Old Testament, we know that God was understood to be well, located in a particular place. It was the Ark of the Covenant. It was in the temple. And that's where you would go to make sacrifice because that's where God was. You want to meet God? Go there. And um, today in Israel, this is in Jerusalem, we know that God said to the people, I have chosen this temple in Second Chronicles, and the people, uh, the people, you know the people of Israel, the wanderings that they had over the years, and, and you realize that uh, the, how Jerusalem was destroyed, that's called the Western Wall. Before it was taken back by the Israelis, it was known as the Wailing Wall. The Western Wall is the remnants of what existed once of the old city. It's the closest thing they have to the old temple, in fact. And so it's a place where those who were devout Jews uh, in the faith of, of, of Judaism uh, go to that wall because they have a connection with history and, they, and they're looking for a connection with God. And I was moved as I stood there and I walked around and I saw many of them would be the Orthodox Jews, you know, with the, the black hats and the black long coats, you know, and the little, little ringlets, you know, here uh, along their side of their face. Uh, devout Jews who'd be standing there and reading from the Talmud, you know, the Old Testament. And, and, and I walked into a side room, just stood in the back, and I saw several of them. And it felt like an old Wednesday night prayer meeting. These people reading, rocking, and calling out to God, Jehovah. I found it so moving. And then I also felt such an ache in my heart to realize as much as they long for God, they've not embraced his son, who is the avenue to God, the person through whom we go to get to God, our intercessor, the means of salvation, Jesus. And uh, as I'm there, I'm, I'm praying for those folks. And, and uh, as... As I looked at that, I realized, you know, how God said that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. When God was working with the people of Israel, his presence was understood to be physically in a particular place. I want you to notice a little bit closer when you look at this, these pictures. You see, you can see the, uh, see how these, some of you, maybe you've been there, you can see these block walls and see that white through there. Those are little prayer notes. In fact, you look at it a little bit closer, you can see. They, they, they write on these and they fold them up and they wad them into that wall. And again, I've moved. Here are people who are hungry for God. People are saying, God, I want to hear from you. I need you to do something. And they don't have to just stick paper in a wall. All they have to do is call upon Jesus. You know, I'm not saying that critically. I'm saying that with my heart, saying, oh, God. God, help us to remember that. God, help us to not substitute things for him. God, help us to know that it's Jesus through whom we must go to find our Lord. 
They still await the Messiah. And instead of worshiping him, they do things like that. And when I, when I look at that, I'm reminded of what Jesus said. Jesus said, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Amen and amen and amen. That's our promise today. We can appropriate that promise today. And I don't care if we're here in the sanctuary, if we're out on the prairie, if we're under a tree, if we're on a boat, if we're sitting on a rock, he is there with us if we gather in his name. Amen? Amen. That's the kind of God that we serve today, a real and living God through Jesus, the Messiah, who liberated us from placing our hopes in just a wall. Our trust is fixed in him. But there is something about mankind. There's something about us that we will settle for substitutes. We will settle for substitutes. Think about the people who had been following God and, and following Moses' lead, and then when Moses went up to worship God and he came down from the mountain, what did he find? There they built a golden calf because they wanted to be like the rest of the folks around them. And they turn that into an idol of worship instead of worshiping the true God. So many times we'll settle for substitutes. And, and we're, we can settle for confining God to his presence to a building or some physical place. There's a historical evidence of this when Barbara and I when you were in Europe. And I, I love history, as you probably have already guessed. In Cologne, Germany, Germany there is this Cologne Cathedral, and um, its construction began in 1248. It just blows me away. They started building this thing in 1248, and in 632 years, they finished it. And you were worried about how long it'd take you here. <laughs> I know you're waiting on the chairs. Believe me, I hope before 632 years... You get your chairs, man. So, you know, just, just mind-boggling. And, and you, look on the, you look on the inside of this place. In fact, let's go. Let's go. We're skipping a slide here somehow. There we go. Um, you look on the inside of the place, and there you'll find on the left is this huge, huge uh, area here where there's the seating, and then there's, of course, the, the platform area up there. There are two more sections, one on each side of this, just this size. And then you look at these. These are massive size um, stained glass windows. Beautiful, massive size. It is, it is, a, it is a tremendous monument to the, the craftsmanship of the people who worked on that. Go back to that other slide. That's one of the entrances. And look at all those ornate carvings. Everything there was done by hand. They didn't have power tools, you know. I, 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 I was inside there, and there's one of these huge, massive columns to support the structure, a fluted column. And I, I, I just had to run my hand down that column and feel how smooth and straight and true that line is. What craftsmen you know, some guys, some years ago, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, with a little chisel and mallet, tap, 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 tapping away. I was just, I was overwhelmed by the craftsmanship involved in that. And then, and then if you look, if you look at uh, this picture, there are gargoyles that are mounted all, I never have understood gargoyles, but uh, <laughs> they were mounted all over this uh, cathedral I mean, isn't that cool? And they have these gargoyles all over this place. The one on the right hand is obviously a replacement. They're forever working on, you know, renewal of this place. The one on the left is older. I don't know <clears throat> if it's an original that is covered with a protective metal sheathing on it. So it is an awesome historical site. It's the second largest spire in northern Europe. And um, who knows how many people gave their lives just to build this. Here's where it gets interesting for me. After 600 years of construction, okay, 600 years of construction, a mere 60 years later, after its conclusion, uh, after it was finished, it was threatened by World War II. Think about the lines of history connecting, you know. And Cologne was absolutely leveled by the Allied bombers. You go somewhere, many places in Europe and through those towns, you'll still see buildings that hundreds of years ago they were built, not in Cologne. They absolutely flattened that place. They've tried to build 
buildings, you have their town square area that they try to make it, they put a facade on it that looks like the old, looks a little cheesy, you know, just, just, it's a fake kind of thing. They're trying hard to make it look old without it being old. So the American and British bombers leveled the city and there was virtually nothing habitable. In fact, look at this picture. Here's the city of Cologne. See, the bridges are collapsed. Here, all, this is just the part the camera's caught of Cologne. All of this, bombed out ruins. That's the way all of Cologne was. All they could do was just, just plow through this to start all over. And yet, look what's standing right there. It's that cathedral. That 632-year-old cathedral remains standing. And it's a real tribute. I salute the American and British bombers because they decided they were not going to destroy that cathedral. They knew it had significant uh, historical and architectural importance to the world, not just to Germany. And so they said, we're going to go around that. In fact, another reason they left it was because it made a great uh, landmark. They could see from miles away flying in. There it is, guys. There are the spires. Cologne's just ahead. Look at the precision. Talk about craftsmen also. Uh, the, the precision they take in bombing to not, it's close all the way around that, to not harm that cathedral. It was quite remarkable. There are points of damage, however, when the American army came in to take control of Cologne, a lot of small arms fire. There are pockmarks like this from fire, firearms uh, all around the building. So they're continually working on reconstructing and, and uh, salvaging that building. And at night, it is a gorgeous place. I don't recall if this is the River Rhine or the Danube. I think the Rhine, looking across the river at it, and it's lit up at night. It is absolutely stunning. But the th cathedral had become part of a Roman church that was more of a political machine. It was filled with corruption, and it was far away from what God wanted it to be. And today, it is owned and operated by the government as a tourist center. Now, they have priests who will conduct masses there on occasion, but it's primarily a tourist center. There are some people I saw who came and sat in those pews and were bowing in prayer, and I, I uh, respect uh, their piousness in wanting to reach the Lord. But the fact of the matter is the cathedral itself is primarily a monument to the past. And in some respects, the cathedral is like that western wall in that they've forgotten about Jesus, except for figurines and other work, which takes us back to that verse again, when Jesus said, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. I'm so thankful for Jesus' promise, aren't you? Something we rediscovered across America also about the church. I'm coming... I'm making a transition. You'll see, I'm making a transition to where we're going today, okay? At first, I want to go back and show you how we lost our way looking at buildings. And now we have to know what we're doing regarding buildings today, just so for those of you who are worried about where I'm going with this. There, there's, a, there's something we rediscovered across America during COVID. Have you heard of that, COVID? Okay. <laughs> Now, I have to give credit to South Dakota. You responded differently than the rest of the country, didn't you? <laughs> and you're just kind of proud of it, too, I would say. <laughs> I, I tell you, our pastors of our open Bible churches on the West Coast, from California to Oregon and Washington, they all deserve Purple Hearts. Because I'm telling you what, the government was forever telling them what they couldn't do. You know, one time we can't meet. One time you can meet if you keep it to 35 people. Another time you can meet if you keep it to this many people only in the parking lot. It was just on and on and on kinds of restrictions. In fact, it was huge, but, but I don't make light of COVID itself. I mean, COVID was serious. We had seven of our senior pastors die. One of our missionaries die. So I'm not one of those people who makes light of COVID. You know, someone would say, well, they all had pre-existing conditions. Yeah, they did, and they would have still been living if COVID hadn't come along, okay? So I'm not here to make fun of COVID. I'm saying it's how we respond to COVID that makes a difference. And we learned some things. You did as a state. You learned something that taught the rest of the country about how to respond to COVID. But among the things we discovered is, first of all, churches could hold church exclusively online. We had many churches. That's all they could do was meet online. 
Well, we've all learned since then, we're all doing church online, and we're thankful for that because there are people who cannot make it here, and if you're watching online, I'm, I'm thrilled that you can be a part of this service today. So we've learned that the church can function without gathering in a building. We know that, right? If something happened to this church and the bombers did make it and hit this church, and this church would blow up, this, this building, this church would still exist, wouldn't it? That's right. Because this is the church. This is the church. So among the things we learned is that, and that also I've learned from pastors across the country who were really hit by this, that uh, post-COVID attendance in many of those churches is now just getting back to between 50 to 75% of what it once was. In many cases, it's like a different congregation almost. And here's the thing that blew me away, surprised me the most. In many of those churches, in many of those places so hard hit in terms of of government regulations uh, in responding to COVID, and people could not get together, financial support actually went up in many of those churches. Actually went up in many of those churches. So here's what we discovered during COVID. It's also true that people of God still need to physically gather. We still need to physically gather. Again, I'm thankful for, for having online, but um, there, there are reasons, good reasons, why we gather as God's people, not merely isolated or hidden from each other. So that leads me to the reason why we are dedicating this facility today. There are many places in the world, we know, where Christians are forbidden to meet at all. In China, they're blowing up church buildings, some beautiful church buildings, blowing them up. In Iran, uh, you could lose your life from meeting together as a group. They are totally an underground church, and the church is exploding. <laughs> it's, it's just miraculous. When, when, when the enemy decides to start, start persecuting God's people, something happened, God said, oh, no, you won't. And there are conversions happening just at an amazing pace. The growth of Christianity under persecution in Iran is just an awesome thing to consider. So, so it begs the question, in light of this history of the church, in light of our ability to hold church online, in light of the, of the, of the cost of doing business, of having a, a church building like this, do we really need church buildings? I mean, why should we even bother to pause to dedicate a facility like this, a worship center like this? Well, I'm going to dare to try to answer that question for you this morning. Christians who are part of the early church were known for this. This is an amazing description of the early church. It says, and they spent all their time in the temple praising God. Now think about that. That is an all-encompassing statement. They spent all their time in the temple praising God. Now, realistically, it probably wasn't all their time. They'd have to go home and wash their clothes, you know, have to put the kids to bed, all of those kinds of things. But what this verse says to me is that any spare moment they could find, any spare moment they could find, they were in church. Why? Because they loved to be at church. They spent their time there because they loved being together with one another praising the Lord. It wasn't just form. It wasn't just merely because of habit. It wasn't because they were expected to. They loved to join with fellow believers to worship. They drew strength. They drew instruction. They got encouragement. They basked in the presence of the Lord as the corporate body came together and they encouraged and uplifted one another. And it's that love for the church gathered in one place that ties us into what we are doing this morning. So we're going to dedicate this worship center and prayer today. And before we do that, I want to just share with you five reasons. If you have a bulletins, you'll see the, those points in there. Uh, five reasons why we dedicate a new or renovated church facility. Father, we come to you today thanking you for this privilege we have of coming here. When we, ref when we reflect on how many places in the world people cannot do what we're doing today or do so under very risk of their lives, oh God, we are so thankful. Help us, Lord, to never take for granted what we have here in this country and in Rapid City. Help us, Lord, to always have our hearts full of thanksgiving. Help us, O oh Lord, to value what you've given us so much 
They w- we want to fully participate in it and be a part of it. Speak to us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why we dedicate a church facility. First of all, a new or renovated church facility is never an end. It represents a new beginning. It represents a new beginning. For 632 years, for generations of people, they doggedly labored to finish that Cologne Cathedral. And that was the focus. Get it done. Can we just get this building done? That was the extent of it. But we realize today as we, as we dedicate this worship center that it is not an end. It represents and is symbolic of a new beginning. That dedication is the setting aside, the consecrating of a place for and to the Lord's work. It's like a new milestone helping you to keep that focus of the church. So the Bible speaks of memorial stones. That they serve as a way of keeping things fresh, keeping our memories fresh. And in some respects, I think an act of dedication is like the arranging of memorial stones. You remember that Jacob, when he had that dream of the angels, you know, descending and ascending on the ladder, and when he woke up from that dream, he said, the Lord was in this place, and I did not know it. And then he went on to say, from this day forward, the Lord God shall be my God. It was a significant turning point in his life, so much so that he built a stone altar. He built a, he built a stone memorial right there. Why? So that he would, it was a point of, remember, of memory. It was a point of remembering what God had done for him in that place. The, the, the absolute erection of those stones in formation. You remember that when the Israelites crossed the River Jordan, <clears throat> when they crossed the River Jordan, Uh, They carried with them 12 stones, one from each of the tribes, because God told them to build a a stone memorial on the other side of the river so that whenever they would pass by, and in particular their children, when their children could pass by and they could say, Mom and Dad, what's that about? Well, let me tell you what that's about. And no one does that better than the Jewish people, tell the stories of the history. Mom and Dad, what is it? Well, let me tell you. Here's what God did for us. This is where we crossed a flooded river and we never thought we'd make it and God parted the waters for us. You need to know about that history and what God has done for us. Pastor Randy mentioned that he and I grew up in the same hometown in Iowa Falls. It was the open Bible church there. And it's a, it, we have a few years between us and it's a good thing because when you have a Randall Bach and a Randy Brock, it really gets confusing. So. And not only that, I played third base and he played third base. And uh, in our minds and our memories, we're the best hitters ever that town has ever seen. And we get better every year. In our, right? That's right. That's right. I mean, we had it all. We had it all. It was, man, probably been no one as good since then, I'm sure. So, uh, but we were comparing notes about that, memories of good memories of things that took place. And, and I have such wonderful memories about growing up in my home church. I don't get there as often as I used to. My parents have been long gone. I used to go back to visit them there and attend church with them. A couple times I've had the opportunity of going into a sanctuary just like this, all by myself. And I would go down to the place where I remember my mom and dad would always come down to pray. And they would kneel there. And this little boy would sit by them wondering if they'd ever get up. but it marked something in me. They modeled something for me. I have built a memorial stone in my own heart to that place. Yes, God can meet me anywhere else. He does, but there's something special about going to that place because of the memories that I have there. So many memories of the good things that God did, the formative experiences that the Lord did for me. And I believe that's happening right here in this place as well. Amen? There's something about that. And so, so when, you, when you dedicate a facility, we're saying, yes, we remember and we will not forget the good things that God has done. Yes, we are pressing on to what he wants us to be, but we will not do it at the sake of losing the memories of what he has done for us. Amen? Amen. Build on that. Cherish those memories. Give thanks to the Lord for that. Places just constructed out of building materials. But when you dedicate it to the Lord, it becomes the house of the Lord. We're saying, Lord, this is yours. This is yours. A church sanctuary is a place where the Spirit of God, responding to our invitation, fills it with 
his presence. He's not confined to a place. He's not confined to a room. But in response to our hearts and worship of the people, he fills it. In Psalm 23, or 22, 3, we read that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. When we're worshiping here this morning, the Lord is inhabiting the praises of his people. Do you know that? Did you feel that? All we have to do is stick our sails up. Raise our sails and catch the wind of what the Spirit is doing even as we worship Him. Our worship invites and ushers in the presence of Almighty God into this place. So dedication to the sanctuary, this worship center, is not an end. It is representative of a new beginning. Second, dedication is our act of giving back to God what He enabled us to do. You don't want to know how you know you're becoming a real disciple of the Lord? I'll tell you. It's when you realize you don't own anything. When you reach a point in your life and say, the things that I think I possess, where I live, what I drive, where I, uh, where I, the toys that I have, so to speak, the things that I technically own, I don't really. I don't own anything. They all belong to the Lord. He has entrusted them to me, to you, as a steward to take care of what belongs to him. That alters our whole outlook on life. That's when you're becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Years ago, God gave Barbara and me an opportunity to, to build a house, and it was pretty much of our own design. It was kind of like our dream house, and it was, it was just so thankful, Lord. It was a God thing that made it possible for us to do that. And, and I just really felt led it is important for us that we would also dedicate, have an act of dedication of that house. I don't know if anybody else has done that before, probably. I didn't know about it, but I decided that's what we would do. We're going to dedicate this house to the Lord. So we invited friends over, and we had a dedication service. And we prayed. and said, Lord, even though our name is on the mortgage, we will never own this, even if we pay off the mortgage. We will not own this. Lord, we vow to be very careful to not place our fingerprints of ownership on this place, we will realize, recognize, this is something you have gifted to us to take care of. We will be a steward of it. Sure enough, four years later, God moved us on to another place. It was a nice house, but it wasn't that house, you know. But you know what? It didn't really bother us. It wasn't our house anyway. It belonged to him. Now, I do drive by that house every now and then to make sure those people are taking care of it the way they should. <laughs> you know? Uh, but, but it's not our house. I'm thankful. God, thank you for giving us the opportunity of living in that place. So dedication of this sanctuary is giving back to him whatever work you did, whatever contributions you've given, whatever you've done to make it all possible, it's really because of him, isn't it? Say, Lord... This you've entrusted to us who want to make sure we do not own this. This belongs to you. And we're taking this step intentionally today, today to declare that to you and before you. When we pray today, that's what we'll be doing, giving this back to him. So dedication is our act of giving back to him what he has enabled us to do. Third, dedication serves as a home for worship and ministry, not as the object of our worship. We don't worship this place. Amen? We worship the holy God. This is the place where we've invited him to come, and we come to meet with him. It is not what we worship. It's the house where that takes place. And that's why the people gathered to be with Jesus. Here are the reasons that people gathered to be with Jesus in the early church. First of all, they came to hear Jesus and to be healed. Jesus was going to be there. Well, Jesus is here with us also. The power of the Holy Spirit is with us. So they came to hear Jesus and to be healed. That's why we first come to church. Secondly, they came to worship God together. There's something about the court, court there's something about the corporate atmosphere. Of, of worship that is hard to describe. It's another one of those things that I know but I can't understand. I mean, I can worship the Lord on my own just like you can worship the Lord on your own, but there's something about the congregation coming together and corporately lifting up the name of Jesus in worship that has a power of its own. Amen? You know what I'm talking about. 
It has a power of its own. And that's one of the reasons we come to worship the Lord. They came together, and we do the same obviously today, to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. You come here, the teaching and the preaching, the discipleship training that you do in this place is so that you can go out from here and then be the church. Amen. Right? We worship as a church here, but we get to go be the church out there in terms of ministry. And then they came to be strengthened. In other words, that is built up in Christ. That when we, come, we go out of this place, we feel just a bit stronger in him than we came in because we've been fortified in the word and by the spirit of God. So those are the reasons today that we still worship the Lord and the reasons why we would dedicate this facility because it's a home for worship and ministry and not the object of our worship. Another reason we dedicate the church is so that we can, it enables us to exercise God-graced hospitality to our guests. Now, we live in the United States. The Word says that you are to take his message to Jerusalem, Judea, and to all the rest of the earth. Where's Jerusalem? Right where you are, isn't it? We're in Des Moines. It begins in Des Moines. For you, it's Rapid City. That's you. And, and it's like concentric circles after that are going out. You don't, you don't you know, bypass the middle so you jump over here. I mean, you don't just go to Japan and you go to Mexico by avoiding Rapid City. You go to Rapid City so that you can go to Japan, Ethiopia, whatever it may be, wherever God would take us. So the fact that you know that your Jerusalem, the place where you start in terms of ministry for the Lord, says you have, you have endeavored to renovate a facility that the people of Rapid City, when they would come in here and say, whoa. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Not to show off, but you're inviting them. You're creating an atmosphere of invitation for people. You didn't come up with some goofy looking place. You don't even put some goofy name on the place. Listen, I've worked with churches for a number of years. I remember one church, that will not be named. Um, one church came up with a name as a new church. They came up with a name that had about seven words in it, and it was weird. And I said to them, could, uh, could you explain to me why, why you chose that name? Well, we had a prophetic word about it. I said, well, okay, that may be what God said to you for you, but the people out there are going to say, what? In other words, you have to be hospitable. You want to be able to reach people for Jesus. And when they come into this place, you want them to say, there's something about the place, yes, and there's something about who fills this place when I'm here in this sanctuary. You want them to feel at home. Now, I've been stayed in a lot of homes over my life. I remember one home where I stayed where before I could close the bathroom door, I had to push away the woman's underwear that was on the floor. And then I could get the door closed. And uh, I wasn't accustomed to seeing that usually. I guess that was the way of making me feel at home. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the way it'd be in our home. In fact, if you came to visit us and I, my underwear would be on the floor of the bathroom, let's just say I wouldn't be here alive today. <laughs> okay? That would not be very hospitable for me to do that, you know. So, so and I remember visiting in a home where someone said, I'd like to fix you a breakfast. And uh, this is on a student tour, Tammy. Uh, I'd like to fix you a breakfast the next morning. And she was saying all the things she could fix. And while she was talking, she kept going like this. <laughs> Cockroaches. <laughs> I said, you know what? I'm, just, I'm not really hungry probably in the morning. I'll be okay without breakfast. So thank you so much for your willingness to do that for me. But it's okay. I, I won't need breakfast. So, um, you know, you want to you wanna be hospitable. Now, let me flip the other side, give you an example of good hospitality. This isn't a church, but I think there's a real application for a church I'll tell you about. For many years, Barbara and I have toured, driven, <laughs> we've been everywhere. Oftentimes, when from Des Moines, we would drive, we live in Des Moines, Iowa, we drive west. Uh, oftentimes, they do a tour that go through Nebraska and go over Colorado, Wyoming, through South Dakota and back. Oftentimes, we do tours like that. Uh, Council Bluffs is just on the other side of the, of the river from Omaha. It's, it's in Iowa. It's not that far away from Des Moines that you would have to stop, typically. You'd wait till later. 
But Barbara insisted that we always had to stop at the same gas station every time. Okay, I know, Barbara. It's Council Bluffs. I know, I've got to stop at that Phillips 66 station. You know why? It's because that station in that era always had fresh cut flowers in the women's bathroom. Yeah? And Barbara, when she walked in there, in fact, a couple times she'd say, come over here, and she'd open the door so I could see in there. She said, look at that. Look at that. That is so nice. I just love that. She felt so welcomed by it. Now, for a guy, it's like, yeah, that's nice, you know. A guy, he probably feels good if he just put a newspaper clipping up over in the wall over here, over something else. But anyway, <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> I saw something in that, in terms of hospitality. In fact, if you are able to come to our national convention this June 13th through 15th, we'll be in Frisco, Texas, which is really just a suburb of Dallas. We're going to have a great time. Yes, that's where we will elect a new president. But you will find there, there is a women's restroom there that has, it has like 20 to 30 stalls in it. It's like, I, there's nothing like this anywhere. It's Texas. <laughs> you will find there will be, by the sink on the counter, there will be fresh cut flowers, and it will say, welcome to the Open Bible Convention. Now, i just like to suggest to you, now I haven't been in your women's restroom, okay? <laughs> Maybe you're doing this in there. Maybe there'd be someone here to catch a vision for that. Not that it has to come out of the church budget. Maybe somebody here would say, hey, that would really be a cool thing for us to do. And, and you, just, you and some other people could go together and just say, we're going to make sure every Sunday there are fresh cut flowers in the women's restroom. Just pass on the guys. They'll get along fine. Put it in the, <laughs> in the women's restroom. And maybe a little something there says, welcome to Open Bible Church. Okay, I think that'd be a great idea. If some of you would think about doing that. So it's all the steps of making it a welcoming place of hospitality. So dedication enables us to exercise god grace hospitality to our guests. Then finally, dedication is like preparing the table so that the Holy Spirit will fill us with the main course. I love to think about it this way. It's like the Bible is our menu. We never tell the Holy Spirit what to do or what to say. However, we do our part in preparing the way. You know, when you plan a worship service like this, you plan what, what uh, songs we're going to sing. Uh, the pastor has prepared what he's going to be sharing with you. But whenever we do that, we realize all we're doing is just doing our part to prepare the table for what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Amen? Yes. We're not the Holy Spirit. We're the ones who prepare the table. We're the waiters. Okay? And I love to think of it in those terms. That whatever I do, whatever I touch, it's not about me. I'm just setting the table. I'm, I'm just preparing the table. And then we ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill that table with all the bountiful goodness and the things that he knows that we need. The things that we don't know that we need. That the Holy Spirit does that in us. He will fill us with the main course. You know, that takes me to that verse again, Luke. So bring this to a close in just a bit. Pastor Randy's going to come and lead us in prayer. And they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. You could do far worse than to spend as much time possible in God's house. I'm so thankful I had parents that led me into God's house at every opportunity. They grafted something in my heart. I will be forever indebted to them. Church was not just uh, something on the side. Church was not just something that if I wasn't busy with something else I would do. Church became the core and the center of our lives and of my life. They spent all their time in the temple praising God. You know, churches, this is just a historical fact. We've seen it in Europe. Churches that gather minimally, exercise a little faith, are devoid of hunger for God and his word, that just go through the motions, oftentimes are dead but don't recognize it. There's no life there. I'm not saying that judgmentally. I'm saying that descriptively, okay? But conversely, churches who love to gather, 
who love to do so at every opportunity, who anticipate and believe for the Spirit of God to move, who are eager to receive instruction from God's Word, who are eager to be equipped to serve Him, those are the churches that are thriving, and I believe that's the Rapid City Open Bible Church. Amen? Amen. One final verse. I love this verse. Paul was writing to uh, the Corinthians, and he was basically telling them about a great example of a church he knows. He said, I want you to guys to see what these Macedonians are like. He said, they absolutely amaze me. They're a great model for you, churches in Corinth. He said, now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They even did more than we hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. When we dedicate this place today, our starting point is rededicating ourselves. Lord, do a fresh work in me. Lord, have your way in this sanctuary. Lord, we give this place back to you. Move freely in our midst. In Jesus' name. Did you appreciate that word? So I want you to help me do something uh, as we close this service. Um, and, and when we prayed uh, these last couple of weeks here in this, uh, in this room, um, at least I did, and I'm sure many did because people were wandering around praying, but laid hands on the walls and said, Lord God, please let people who walk through these doors sense the presence of God in this place. It's a place of meeting. And so I'd like you to help me do something. I'm going to ask you to get up and, and turn off your cell phones. And then, uh, <laughs> don't you hate it when that happens? We were in a funeral once, and the pastor's wife, this was at a you know, very large church, and, and uh, the, the, her phone went off in her purse. And, and I saw her you know, get her foot down there and kick it over to the next person. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that wasn't on the agenda. <laughs> but I'd like you to help me to do something. I want you just to get up, and I want you to find a wall to lay your hands on. I want this place surrounded with people. And, and, and even on the platform, those of you that are here, uh, from, maybe you want to come up to the platform. But I'd like everybody just to find a place where you can lay your hands on the wall. And there's a reason why this kind of thing matters, when we have to actually do something. The Lord loves watching this. He loves watching this. This is, this is what he tunes in for. Is, is, is anything magic going to happen because we touch something? No. But something spiritual will happen because the Spirit of God is within you. This is, this is what priests do. These walls you have helped build. Everything you see, you have helped build and you've set that table. What a great analogy that is. But I want you to pray with me. So, so pray with me as you lay your hands on that spot. Father, every place in this building, this room right now, we touch it. And we ask that the Holy Spirit would just flow through that touch. We know, Lord God, that you don't inhabit inanimate objects anymore. But, Lord, you can bless things. And so, Father, what we're asking for symbolically today is that when people enter this place, they would feel the love of Jesus and the presence of Jesus in these walls. As they sit down, they would sense that something is going to happen in my life today. And I pray, Lord God, that it would be because we are a house of prayer. This is a house of prayer. And we believe in every prayer. We believe that they make a difference. So we ask you, Lord Jesus, to intercede before the Father that he might bless this sanctuary. 
that he might use this Lord Jesus as a center of worship and that God, people will know and sense the people that come into this place and worship are sincere and authentic and real and loving and kind that the fruit of the Spirit flow through all of us. So we dedicate these walls, Lord God. We dedicate these furnishings. And Lord God, we rededicate our life to be a servant at that table. And Lord Jesus, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing this sanctuary. In your name we pray. Everybody said, amen, amen. Praise God. Now you can just stay right there if you want to. I'm going to dismiss you. But I want to bless you in Jesus' name. I want you to find a place to pitch your tent. I want you to find people you can invest in. And I want you to come back next week to be with us in the house of God. I am so excited about the word next week as we talk about stewarding the tabernacle. What does that mean? How do we steward the tabernacle? So God bless you folks. We love you. If there's any need you have, you come down to this front and we'll pray for you, okay? Have a wonderful week. Love you so much.